Evangelist August Rosado with Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries. We want to thank you so much for tuning in on this Friday afternoon as we are coming to you live from our main headquarters here in Lincoln, Rhode Island. Great to be here with all of you today. And uh, it's the end of the week. <clears throat> the weekend is here. And I hope you have an opportunity to relax and enjoy your weekend with your family. And uh, remember to uh, stay safe, practice social distancing, wear your mask. And uh, we are not out of this pandemic as of yet. You know, if you know me, I always avoid the conspiracy theories. There are so many conspiracy theories out there. And I personally cannot talk to people that are into this conspiracy stuff. Everything to them is a conspiracy. And so... I don't trust the government either, so I'll just I'll just say that um, up front. But I use common sense, and I always look at everything from a biblical standpoint. <clears throat> As believers, we must have a biblical worldview. I've talked about this before. We must have a biblical worldview when we go to the voting booth. We must vote with a biblical world view. And, you know, it's an election year. And uh, you have a president who stands for the unborn. You have a president that wants to kill babies. I mean, there's really no other way to say it. And I'm going to vote with my biblical conscience. I'm going to vote for the lesser of two evils. I'm going to vote for a candidate who stands with Israel and a candidate who stands for the unborn. That's where I'm coming from. It would be inappropriate for me to tell anybody who to vote for, but I know who I'm voting for. And so it's, it's imperative today that we vote with a biblical world view. Unfortunately today, not a lot of Christians are following that and it's amazing today that the church will swallow anything hook line and sinker without having some form of a biblical worldview that's the reason why I come to you Wednesday through Friday to give you a biblical prophetic perspective not my opinions. I mean, we're all entitled to our opinions. But when it comes to the Bible, that's the final authority. Our opinions mean nothing when it comes to Scripture. The Bible is the final authority. Not some guy in Rome. Not some pastor of a church down the street. Not some governor or even a president. The final authority is God's Word. The divine, inerrant, authoritative Word of the living God. That's the reason why we need to weed out through the fluff and the nonsense that's involved in politics as well as in theology. A lot of fluff, a lot of hype, a lot of sensationalism. You need to weed through that stuff. Whether it's in politics or theology. And you need to come to a proper biblical understanding. I don't know it all. Okay? I'm looking at my degrees up here on the wall. It's just pieces of paper. I'm looking at two Bible college diplomas. I'm looking at a master, a, a, a master of theology degree. I'm right now working on my doctorate. They're just pieces of paper. That's all they are to me. It's just pieces of paper. I need to have an understanding of what the Bible says for its plain sense interpretation. August Rosado doesn't know it all. Like all of you that are watching, I am a student of Bible prophecy. I am a student of the Bible, studying it for the past 32 years. I'm nothing more than a student. 
I am no expert. I am no authority. The Bible is the authority. And if there's anybody who's an expert when it comes to the land of Israel, the Jewish people, the nations of the world, God is the expert. God alone is the expert. And the Bible is unambiguous as to who God gave the land to. Who are the indigenous people of the land of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel? And you know, you cannot trust the media today. You just can't. You always get that liberal bit. When I'm in Israel, and I've been to Israel 27 times, I, I, if it wasn't for this pandemic, I would have already been there three times this year. But I've been to Israel 27 times, and what I see over there, and what's being reported when I come back to the United States here, folks, it is totally different. You cannot trust the liberal media. You just can't. Whether it's social media or media on TV. The bias reported out there, especially when it comes to Israel, is absolutely unprecedented. The double standards are unprecedented. Yeah, I, I cannot watch ABC, CBS, NBC, because they are so biased in their reporting. And don't even get me started on CNN, MSNBC, all these other. They are so liberal in their reporting. It would make a maggot puke, for lack of a better term. And being an election year, you will see if you haven't seen it already. They are pouring it on to make sure that a certain candidate doesn't get reelected. They will say anything. They will do anything to make sure a certain conservative candidate doesn't get either elected or reelected. And so, again, being an election year, you must vote with a biblical world view. It's imperative that we do that. And this is the reason why I am going to uh, talk about today a prophetic look at the city of David, the Jewish connection. And the liberal, re the liberal reporting when it comes to Israel, the Jewish people, their connection to the land is absolutely horrendous. And the British Broadcasting Company is the worst of the worst in terms of the United Kingdom. And I'm going to share with all of you today a report from the BBC on what they said concerning the city of David. We're going to be talking about the city of David. There are two city of Davids in the Bible, just as there are two Bethlehems in the Bible. Two kings were born in the city of David. One king conquered the city of David 3,000 years ago. Another king in the future will conquer the city of David and reign from that very city. I'm going to talk about all of that today. So as usual, I ask all of you to take your Bibles, and I'm going to show you where to open in just a few moments. Get a pen and paper, write some notes down. It's very important that you do that. Let me just say a quick shalom to Amanda Tatro, John Webb, and my dear friend Andy Laird. Great to see you here, Andy. Artemio Cruz, great to see you. And uh, I know that there will be uh, more coming into the room as we...
progress with our study today. I should have had uh, one of my books here. I thought I did, but I don't. So let me just get out of the uh, frame for a minute and just grab a, uh, a book over here. Should have this before. You know, when you're always racing to do something, you forget, you know, certain things. But uh, yesterday I was at the post office pretty much half the day mailing out my new book, The Revived Roman Empire. Why the EU or the European Union is the embryo for the end time empire of the Antichrist. This is my seventh book. I'm going to be working on another book. It's going to be a it's going to be a study guide. Yes, a study guide on the book of Revelation. I am so looking forward to working on that. And I'm hoping to get it out not six months from now, three months from now. I want to get it out as soon as possible. So I'm going to be working on that study guide on the book of Revelation, looking at it chronologically where you're going to be able to write in the uh, blank spaces, the, the line spaces, to fill it in. So I, I'm really excited about that. But right now, I'm excited about my seventh book, my brand new book, The Revived Roman Empire. It only runs just a little over 100 pages. And the chapters are brief. You're not going to read 40 pages of a chapter before you get to the next chapter. I don't like doing that stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I just, I just like to get into it, man. I, with me, when I write a book, I like to hit and run. Hit and then run to the next chapter. Hit, run to the next chapter. That's what I do in this book. The chapters are brief. And then I provide a blank page for prophecy notes for you to write your thoughts down. And then get to the next chapter, read it, get to the blank page, prophecy notes, write your thoughts down. And so... Um, all of you that have sent in your orders, your books are on the way. And so if you've put an order in, your books are going to be coming in soon. So I'm excited about this new book, The Revived Roman Empire. And I'm convinced without a shadow of a doubt that the European Union will be the springboard for the Antichrist when he comes on the world stage being energized by Satan, the dragon in Revelation chapter 12 verse 3 to become the beast of Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 1 and I prove in this book like a lawyer in a court of law why I'm convinced the EU fits the bill a final ten nation uh, revived Roman Empire will come into existence and those ten nations described in Daniel as ten toes and later on ten horns will give global authority to the Antichrist when he comes on the world stage after the church has been taken out of the world at the rapture and then the beast will come on the world stage and he will confirm a seven year peace treaty with the nation of Israel and when that happens out of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 that will kick off day one of a 2520 day countdown 2520 days is seven years that will lead up to the second coming of Jesus back to this earth at the end of the seven year period of tribulation mind you before the tribulation Jesus comes at the rapture to call the church out of the world seven years later he returns back to this earth with his church to come to the land of Israel to the city of Jerusalem to establish his kingdom he will defeat the beast and the false prophet. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm just throwing some basics at you here. And he's going to establish a kingdom that will emanate from the city of Jerusalem. 
And so what I'm going to show you today is we're going to go briefly through Jewish history. Listen, when you read the Bible, you are reading Jewish history. When you read the Old Testament, you're reading Jewish history. The New Testament, you're reading Jewish history. And we should never, ever, ever lose sight of that. It's unfortunate today that the church has divorced itself from its Jewish roots. That is very unfortunate. You're all, listen, you're only getting half the picture if you've, if you've cut the Jewish roots off. But when you have an understanding of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, you're reading everything in 3D, in technicolor, like they used to use back in the, back in the day, in technicolor. In 3D, you're getting the whole picture. And that's what we're going to do today. And that's the reason why I want you all to have your Bibles and... Um, Let's get ready to go. So, again, if you haven't ordered my new book, order it. You can do that by going to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Click on, go to the store, click on bookstore, and you'll see the book right there, uh, The Revived Roman Empire. If you are interested in a four-book order, I've not only written this book, I've written other books like Looking for the Promise of the Blessed Hope, Bible Eschatology 1 and Bible Eschatology 2. We'll give you a deal on those four books. All you simply need to do is contact me and say, August, how can I get a deal on all four books? Even though I've written seven of them, those are the four main books right there. How can I get a deal on those other four books? And I'll, I'll show you uh, what you need to do, and we'll give you a good offer on those books and autograph the books for you all right why don't we get into it right now I want you to take your Bibles we're gonna to go to the Old Testament we're gonna to go to 2nd Samuel chapter number 5 looking at verses 5 through 7 2nd Samuel chapter 5 verses 5 through Seven. Chapter 5 records David being made king over Israel and how he takes the city of David from a people who were occupying the city. They were called the Jebusites. Jerusalem, before it was even called Jerusalem, was called Jebus. And even earlier before that, in the book of Genesis, it was called Salem. Later on, Jebus, and then Jerusalem. David leaves Hebron, goes to Jerusalem. The Jebusites were mocking him, saying, David, you're not going to take this city. The line of the line, the, the blind and the lame can repel you from taking the city. You won't take the city. But we saw a whole different ball game here. Now, in 2 Samuel 5, verse 5, it says, um, actually, let me begin in verse 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, you know, in the West we say Hebron or Hebron, but in Israel they pronounce it Hebron, with a V as in Victor, Hebron. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, or so seven and a half years. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, Thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. The Jebusites were probably shouting down from the wall, Oh, David, why don't you just get out of here? Our blind people and our lame people can stop you 
from taking the city. You're not going to take the city, David. But when we read verse 7, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Zion, Zion in Hebrew. Zion and Jerusalem are synonymous terms. When you say Zion, you're referring to Jerusalem. When you say Jerusalem, you're referring to Zion. Zion is an upper hill in Jerusalem. So when we say in Hebrew, Har Sion, mountain of Zion, or we would say uh, Har Yerushalayim, mountain of Jerusalem. So they're both synonymous terms. Now, the city of David goes back 3,000 years. And the Bible is clear. Who established the city and made it the capital of Israel. We just read it right here in 2 Samuel 5, verses 5 through 7. Today, this fact, this biblical fact, is denied by the liberal media. Anti-Semites say that the Jews have no connection to the land and have a clear hatred of Israel, and yet they say they have no bias. This is like saying a great white shark is a vegetarian. They ignore the biblical narrative that uh, it's a fairy tale, what we just read here in 2 Samuel 5, it's legend. It's a fairy tale. And they reject the biblical account of the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, and particularly to the city of David. We see a clear account in 2 Samuel chapter number 5 of how the city of David was established, and it was established by a Jewish king, Melech David, that's Hebrew, for King David, who was Israel's second king. During the period of what is known as the United Monarchy, this was under the first three of Israel's kings, which were Saul, Israel's first king, after Saul, David, then after David, David's son, Solomon. Now, the kingdom split under Solomon's son, after the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam became king. And because of his foolishness, the kingdom of Israel split roughly at around 930 BC. And this was known as the period of the divided monarchy. With two tribes going to the south, Judah and Benjamin, making Jerusalem their capital, and ten tribes going to the north, with Samaria as their capital. Under Saul, David, and Solomon, the kingdom was united. But under Rehoboam, the kingdom split. and It just became a mess. But David established his capital under the occupation of the Jebusites. And again, as I said, Jerusalem at that time was called Jebus because the Jebusites occupied the land. Later, it was called Jerusalem. Jerusalem, as I said, was known as Salem and Jebus as well as other names in Scripture. But we see in 2 Samuel chapter 5 when David was crowned king, his base of operations at first was at Hebron. And we see again in verse 5, in Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months. But then David leaves Hebron, conquered Jerusalem, and the same verse says, and he reigned 33 years in Jerusalem over all Israel and Judah. 
So at first, Hebron was his base of operations. Then he moves it from Hebron to Jerusalem, where he reigns for 33 years, 40 in all. David reigned in Hebron for seven and a half years. And, you know, I had the opportunity to take my tour group to Hebron. For, uh, this was my first time. <coughs> Excuse me. This was my first time going to Hebron and all my trips to Israel. Tour groups don't go to Hebron because some feel it's dangerous. And we never had uh, an, an issue going there. When we got there, the former mayor of Hebron met with my tour group and he couldn't speak any English so our, our tour guide was translating. And he told our tour group, you're very brave to come here to Hebron, but we're so thankful that you're here. And we had a wonderful time over there in Hebron. Again, we had no security issues at all. None going there and coming out. We weren't threatened. We didn't feel threatened. Did not have an issue. And I also took my tour group to the cave of Machpelah, mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapter number 25. This is where the patriarchs and the matriarchs are buried. We're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the matriarchs, Sarah, Leah, and Rebekah. Rachel's not buried there because Rachel died on her way to Bethlehem, according to the Bible. But we had a, a wonderful time there. That is where David reigned for seven and a half years until he moved his base of operations to the city of David. David reigned for 33 years in Jerusalem, 40 years in all. When David came to take Jerusalem, as I said already, the Jebusites mocked him saying he couldn't take the city. Our own blind and lame could take you on, David. But yet, verse 7 says, very clearly, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is Ur David. Let's learn a little Hebrew here. Let's say Ur, I-R, Ur. Everybody say Ur where you are. Ur, I-R, Ur. That's Hebrew for city. And then David, David, David. So let's combine both those Hebrew words together. Ur, er, David, city of David. When I take my tour groups to Jerusalem, I love to take them to the ancient ruins of the city of David. It's located southwest of the old city. That's where David's operations were located 3,000 years ago. Now, there are two city of David's in Israel. One is Bethlehem and the other is Jerusalem. Both are called the city of David. Two kings were born in the city of David. Those two kings were born in Bethlehem. King David and another king, Yeshua. Everybody say Yeshua. That's the Hebrew name for Jesus. Yeshua means salvation. So King David was born in the city of David, Bethlehem. And Yeshua, King Jesus, was also born in the city of Bethlehem. One king born there is mortal, King David. The other king born there is divine. That would be Yeshua. That would be the Lord Jesus. David was born in Bethlehem according to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 12. I'm going to read that for you quickly. 1 Samuel Chapter 17 and verse number 12 says this. Now David was the son of that Ephratite of 
Bethlehem, whose name was Jesse. So David was born in Bethlehem. Now in the New Testament, according to Luke chapter 2 verse 11, a divine king would be born there as well. And in Luke chapter 2 verse 11 it says this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Ur David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Moshiach Shel Adonai in Hebrew. Messiah the Lord, Christ the Lord. In Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 it says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Actually, there are two Bethlehems in Israel. A Bethlehem in the Galilee in the north and a Bethlehem in the south in Judea. Therefore, the Jewish prophet Micah was very specific when he would prophesy where the Messiah would be born in Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. When Micah prophesied about the birth of the Messiah, he said, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata. That's why in 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 12 it says that uh, David was an Ephratite, Bethlehem. If Micah would have just said, but thou Bethlehem, well, the reader would have been left scratching his head saying, uh, Micah, which, which Bethlehem are you talking about here? The Bethlehem in the north, in the Galilee, or the Bethlehem in the south? That's the reason why Micah said, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata. So now the reader would say, oh yes, now we know what you're talking about. The Bethlehem in Judea. That is where the Messiah would be, do, would be born, which is why Matthew 2 1 says that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Bethlehem Ephrata prophesied 700 years earlier by the Jewish prophet Micah in the Old Testament. There are two Bethlehem towns in Israel. And there are two cities of David. Bethlehem and Jerusalem in the south. The biblical narrative and the archaeological evidence clearly show a Jewish connection to the land. The BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, in my estimation, has to be one of the most liberal media outlets in the United Kingdom. It is the United Kingdom version of CNN here in the United States. They are anti-Israel to the core. Now, the Arutz Sheva, or Israel Channel 7 News reported, BBC under fire for planned documentary on the city of David in Jerusalem. The NGO, which is uh, an Israel-based uh, organization in Israel, maintains historical Jewish sites in Jerusalem, warns that the upcoming BBC documentary on the city of David is already tainted by the journalist's anti-Israel bias. They said the documentary would be fair and balanced. That's what they, that's what this BBC documentary said. <clears throat> Excuse me. That they would be fair and balanced, which is a lie from the get-go. The documentary exhibited a transparent bias against Israel and Jewish claims to the city. Deriding Jewish life in eastern Jerusalem as the uh, settling of Jewish people in occupied land. So obviously they're not fair and balanced here. It is also reported reported uh, uh, they characterize Jerusalem as occupied land and occupied territory. 
This is according to the City of David Foundation in Jerusalem. It's also according to the Alad organization in Jerusalem. And the documentary said, the BBC documentary, that Israel is violating international law. Let me tell you something. No such international law exists. But they all love using this. The European Union, the BBC, CNN, all these media outlets are saying Israel is violating international law when no such international law exists. It went on to say, for the documentary, the BBC's Rosie Carthway, who's putting this whole thing together, has been accused of harboring an anti-Israel bias. This January, she came under fire. I should say last January, she came under fire for sharing a social media post which included maps claiming to show the spread of Israel over Palestine. Despite the latter never having existed. No such place called Palestine. No such people called Palestinians ever existed. It's a fabrication. It's a myth. It was made up. By the way, it was made up by, in 1964 by the late Palestinian terrorist Yasser Arafat who founded the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. It is a myth, ladies and gentlemen. The report said it is clear from her questions and statements that the program intends to vilify Israel, to vilify Jewish history and Jewish charities and present a number of false and misleading claims. So much for being fair and balanced. The Arut Shever news agency reported that the production appears to be an anti-Israel hit piece designed as a direct attack on the city of David. The BBC is so liberal that BBC's new Director General Tim Davey has concerns how the network is operating. He made statements about re-evaluating the way the BBC network reports and operates. Man alive. If only someone at CNN had a little common sense as well on how they operate. Just as David took Jerusalem from the Jebusites and reigned as king in that city 3,000 years ago, as we read in 2 Samuel chapter number 5, one day in the future, another king will take Jerusalem from the forces of the Antichrist that's Revelation 19, 19 and 20, and reign from the city of Jerusalem. Call on Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse number 17. And we clearly see in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob and establish his kingdom. Luke says he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There shall be no end. Jesus will sit on David's throne from Jerusalem and reign from that city for 1,000 years. We see that number 1,000 years in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 through 7. Six times it tells us that Jesus will reign for a thousand years. I take that number to be literal. I take Jesus' reign to be literal. To be physical and bodily from the city of Jerusalem. And I'll tell you this. I'm alarmed to see some Christians deny an earthly bodily reign of Jesus from Jerusalem as earth's capital. But the Bible is unambiguous about this. And not only that, a temple will stand during that time. Described as the Millennial Temple in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, covering 202 detailed verses. 
in your own time, read Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46. You would have read 202 verses between those chapters describing that millennial temple. And based on Zechariah chapter 6, 12 and 13, it's going to be the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, that's going to build that temple. And he will reestablish David's throne. And may I add, King David will be resurrected and be somewhat co-regent under the Lord Jesus. You say, where do you find that in the Bible? I'm just not going to just throw something at you without backing it up from Scripture. <laughs> but I'm glad you asked. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 23 and 24, as well as Ezekiel 37, 24 and 25, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9, and Hosea chapter 3, verse 5, all tell us David will be resurrected and will be co-regent under the Lord Jesus. David will reign as a prince. Jesus is going to reign as a king. From the very center of the earth. Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 5. Yerushalayim. Say that with me in Hebrew. Yerushalayim. Some well-known prophecy guy always does it with the roll of his tongue. Yerushalayim. The Jews don't roll their tongue when they say Jerusalem in Hebrew. It's Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. He will reign from that city in the Millennial Kingdom for 1,000 years. You say, well, August, I don't find the word millennium in the Bible. And you're right. But that's where that word 1,000 years comes in. It comes from two Latin words. Malay, thousand a numb years combine those two latin words millay a numb millennium what do you get revelation chapter 20 verses 2 through 7 one thousand years it's simple it's simple like the word rapture the word rapture is not in the bible but i teach the rapture why it comes from the latin vulgate bible the word caught up in first thessalonians 4 17 is rapturo. That's a Latin word, rapturo. Where we get the English word rapture, which simply means to seize or to snatch away. In the Greek, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it's harparzo, which has the same connotation as the Latin rapturo, to seize or to snatch away. That's going to happen at the next main event on God's calendar of activities. Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem. Make no mistake about it. When Zechariah 14.4 tells us one day his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. That happens at the end of the seven year period of tribulation. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. I always take my tour groups to the Mount of Olives. Love it. That's what Jesus gave the very first Bible Prophecy Conference 2,000 years ago. The Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. His feet will touch them. Uh, by the way, he ascended back into heaven after his three and a half years of ministry from the Mount of Olives. And at a second coming, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives is going to split in half. But before all that could happen, before you can have a second coming, before you can have a tribulation period, the next main event on God's calendar of activities is the rapture of the church. That takes place before the seven year period of tribulation commences on this earth. And you need to be ready. You need to be ready for the rapture. Uh, and you also need to be ready for death. Either or, you need to be ready. You see, August, how can I get ready? It's simple. By putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. To ask Him to forgive you of your sins. To come into your life 
to be your Lord and personal Savior. You must repent of your sins. Change of heart, mind, and attitude. That's all repentance means. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 5, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. You will die and go to a Christless hell. That's not God's will for you. But if you go there, you've made the decision to go, not God. The Lord died for your sins, my sins as well. We all deserve to go to hell. You don't see no halo over my head, do you? We all deserve to go to hell. All of us. But God in His love and mercy sent His Son to die for you. To take your sins on Him. And the Lord Jesus wants to give you the free gift of eternal life. All you simply need to do is, by faith, receive it. Call upon the name of the Lord and get saved. It's as simple as A, B, C. And if you would like to know how to do that, I'd love to sit down and talk with you or even talk with you over the phone and show you how you can know for sure without a shadow of a doubt one day heaven will be your home and you'll be ready for either death or the rapture of the church in which all born-again believers, dead and alive, will be caught up to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And I would love to talk with you and show you how to do that. Actually, in my new book, The Revived Roman Empire, at the very end, I give the plan of salvation on how to get saved. Jesus didn't come to give you religion. He came to give you a relationship with him, an intimate relationship. So if you want to know how to do that, get a hold of me, and I'll show you from the scriptures what you need to do. Let me say hello to Joe Nell Renfro. Great to see uh, Joe Nell with us. Joshua, Nathaniel, Natorchi. Uh, it's so great to have you with us. He says, admit you are a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Call upon the Lord and be saved. See, right there. A, B, C. It's as simple as that. So, as we bring the broadcast to an end, Visit my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Navigate around my website, check it out. Check out the videos on the newsletter, you know, on the website, and in my newsletters, or, you know, go to my contact form and request our newsletters. Just give me your name, your email address, request you want the letters. They go out every week. We just have them go out yesterday. You can read that newsletter on my Facebook timeline. It's right there. Go to my store. You can order our Holy Land products, my books, my brand new book, The Revived Roman Empire. People like Artemio Cruz, Andy Laird, um, Amanda Tatro, John Webb. This book is on its way to you. And uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. I self-publish my books. I don't go through publishing companies. You know why? They charge an arm and a leg. They did that with my first book. So, you know, you, 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 you learn. You know, you live and learn. So I go through a self-publishing company, and uh, they publish my books to me, so I cut out the middleman and, 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 and pass the savings on to you. So uh, I hope the book is a blessing to you. You can um, order many things that we have on our website, and you can also help support our ministry. And you can do that by uh, clicking on the uh, donate button at the very bottom of my webpage, todayinbibleprophecy.org. And uh, you can give a one-time gift or a monthly gift, as some of you are doing right now, or some of you have it automatically come out of your checking account once a month. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. But, you know, it's people like you that keep us going to proclaim the Lord's soon return. To go to Israel to share the gospel with Jews and Arabs while we're out there. Unfortunately, with COVID, we can't do that right now. I, I was supposed to lead a tour to Israel this past March. That didn't happen. We're supposed to go October 29th. I don't think that's going to happen either. So I, I'm hoping and praying that this virus just gets out of here. Enough of this stuff already. So that we can get back to Israel. 
get back to sharing the gospel with Jews and Arabs out there. Teach Bible prophecy on location there in the Holy Land. Bring our tour groups back over there. Israel's heading for another, another lockdown. And they're saying it's probably going to end up being two weeks. And they're once again going to cancel flights in and out of Israel. They're not going to have any flights coming in and out of Israel. And their economy is really, really hurting over there. I got tour, tour Israeli tour guides over there that are personal friends of mine. And they're saying, August, man, we are hurting. We are hurting. So uh, pray for them over there. Pray for us over here. And I'm hoping that by the end of the year, this, this virus is gone. Enough of this stuff already. Just, you know, it's, well, I mean, it happened mid-March. So it's been at least, you know, going on five months now. So let's let's pray that this thing's out of here. This 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 virus isn't bigger than the Lord. I'll tell you that right now. So, as usual, every Friday, I always pray the ironic blessing to you in Hebrew, out of Numbers chapter six, twenty-four through twenty-six. Aaron, the high priest, Israel's first Kohen Hagadol, Israel's first uh, high priest. Stretch out his hands and split his fingers, right? You Star Trek fans out there would split his fingers. That would form the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Sheen. Looks like a fancy W, Shaddai, El Shaddai, the name of God. And he would pray the prayer in Hebrew over the children of Israel, B'nai Israel. And I will pray the prayer for you in Hebrew, and then I will uh, translate it for you in English. This prayer is for your health, your finances, and your family. So, I'll pray in Hebrew, and then we'll translate it into English. Shalom. The Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. And give thee peace. May he give you shalom. May he give you peace. In these trying times. And the only peace. That man will ever know. Something the UN will never achieve. Is having a relationship. With the Sar Shalom. The Prince of Peace. Yeshua. The Lord Jesus. The Messiah of Israel. The Savior. Of the world. The Head of the Church. Not some guy in Rome. Jesus is the head of the church. And I hope that you would come to know him personally in these trying times <clears throat> by calling upon the name of the Lord. So I appreciate all of you uh, joining us today. I hope to see you, Lord willing, next Wednesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another Bible prophecy update. So remember, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon, sooner than we think. The rapture must be right around the corner. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Lord willing, we're hoping to see you next week. Take care. Have a great weekend. Keep it safe. Practice that social distancing. Wear a mask if you have to in public crowded areas. Protect you and your family. And uh, we will see you next week. Take care and God bless. Bye.